As you may or may not know, my wife and I just got back from Vegas. It was a great trip. We ate, we drank, we had a blast. But then we got home and looked at the credit card, and uh, I gotta say, it doesn't matter how much fun you're having, 25 bucks for a drink is a ripoff. Frickin' Vegas. I hate getting ripped off, and so do the lads over at Harry's. They spent years watching the razor blade companies rip people off and said, No more! Not all heroes wear capes, my friends, and they want to prove that they're legit by offering you hot dogs a $13 trial set for just 3 bucks at harrys.com slash RTG. I've been telling you about them for months, and I'm genuinely proud to have Harry's as a sponsor of this show. I wasn't kidding. The plastic, futuristic-looking crap razors you get at the store are overpriced, and they're poor quality. Harry's blades are crisp, clean, and classy. They're the kind of razor you'd expect your grandpa to have on his bathroom counter. And most importantly, they work. Shave after shave, they're so smooth, they're precise. I used to go through the crappy store blades all the time, but Harry's are built to last. And they're not just better quality than the other names, they're more affordable. And they deliver. Just set your schedule, and for as little as two bucks, new blades, shaving creams, lotions, everything you need, right to your door when you need it. I genuinely cannot think of a reason not to try Harry's. And I'm not just saying this because they're sponsors. They're the best shaving supplies I've ever used. Try them out. And if you're not happy, your shave's on them. And unlike the other subscriptions, they're really easy to cancel if you want to, too, which is a nice bonus, but... Believe me, you're, you're not going to want to cancel. Getting ripped off isn't funny. Switch to Harry's. Get started with a $13 trial set for just 3 bucks at harrys.com slash RTG. That's harrys.com slash RTG for a $3 trial set. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Remember the Game. It is my retro gaming podcast where every week a buddy of mine and I sit down and we geek out about the games we played back in the day. My name is Adam Blank. Thank you so much for listening to the show. This week it is episode 94 and we are talking about Spyro the Dragon for the original PlayStation 1. Uh, Maybe I should have saved like NHL 94 for episode 94, but I wasn't planning that far in advance back in like the 50s and 60s when we covered NHL 94. But anyway, Spy- Spiral's great. Good episode to do for number 94. Uh, every month our Patreons can vote on a poll of games that we haven't covered on the show yet and then the winner gets an episode the following month. Spiral the Dragon won March's poll and so here it is. I delivered as promised. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this one. A lot of you guys have been asking about us covering Spyro for a, quite a while. I never played it as a kid, so I guess finally got to play through it in preparation for this episode. And uh, this is not an Echo the Dolphin episode. This one's going to be good. I like this game. I like this game a lot. And I'm going to tell you all about that in a few minutes. Before I get into that, you know I've got a ramble. And if you don't want to listen to the rambling, skip it. But please listen to the rambling. It's part of the show. We got news about Last of Us 2 and stuff. Uh, I already mentioned quickly our Patreon poll. In case you didn't know, our Patreon exclusive episodes of Expansion Pass, which is our supplementary podcast, are now back behind our Patreon wall. Uh, If you enjoyed those and you'd like to get access to every upcoming episode, which goes live every single Sunday, sign up over at patreon.com slash remember the game. It is only two bucks a month. You can vote in our Patreon polls every month. You get episodes of Expansion Pass. You get uh, a chance to win a prize, which this month will be a game of the winner's choice. Next month will probably be a Switch Lite, assuming I can find one. And you get a shout out on the show, just like all of these beloved Patreon supporters of ours. Robert L., longtime supporter of the show, thank you so much. Rome21, it took me forever to figure out how to say your name, but I got it down now. Thank you. Ryan White, same name as a former Montreal Canadian who I actually really liked quite a bit. Shout out to Scott, that is all I have for your name, so I can't think of anything clever to say. Shout out to Sean P., um, 
I, I'm going to guess that the P stands for pedigree because that's just the first word that pops in my mind. So Sean P. Sharonic, longtime supporter of the show from the great metropolis of Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Slick Rick, the coolest name here on our Patreon supporters, I believe. Thomas Christian, a uh, very good friend of mine that I've been chatting with on Twitter and stuff like that, who likes the Arkham games, so he's got some class. Todd, my pal from down under. I uh, hope things are good in Australia. Shout out to Tyler who is actually a frequent guest here on the show and a Patreon supporter and one of our newer supporters, Will Grace. And I have no idea if that is a name or if that is a play on the show's name that you really like. But regardless, thank you so much to all of you guys for supporting our show. We really, really appreciate it. It's only two bucks a month, you guys. You get all that cool stuff. That's like 50 cents a week. Shout outs, Patreon polls, chances to win, extra episodes every Sunday. Fucking yeah, that's pretty... That's a good deal. So, and it's back. So, patreon.com slash remember the game. You don't have to hear about that anymore. Uh, speaking of uh, expansion pass, our second, our secondary show, I think this Sunday I'm going to do some Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5 predictions and break down that a little bit more. I kind of talk about them a little bit every week, but I haven't gone into a ton of detail. And a few weeks ago when I did the sale suggestion episode of Expansion Pass, I put up a poll. Did you guys want my suggestions for all the sales going on right now? Or did you want next-gen predictions? And sales won about 60-40 in the polls. So I've been wanting to do a prediction episode for a while, and it looks like we're going to be seeing some news on the next-gen consoles in May, so I want to get my predictions out there so I can say I called my shot if I get any of them right. Uh, I'm going to break down what Sony has to do to win a fifth straight generation because whether you want to admit it or not, whether you're a Sony fanboy or you hate Sony or whatever, uh, they have dominated for 20 years. Uh, So what do they have to do to stay on top? What does Microsoft have to do to finally take down the giant? And what does Nintendo have to do uh, to stay relevant next gen with a system that's going to be four years old? at that point so uh and i'm there's not gonna be any safe predict pr- predictions i'm gonna kind of go out on a limb and try to call my shot on a few of those things so i'm really looking forward to that so that'll be the episode that goes live this sunday if you want to access check out expansion pass uh thank you all for the nice feedback regarding the final fantasy 7 episode that we put out last sunday uh if you did if you missed it it's a half review half spoiler cast it was available it's an expansion pass episode as well and uh if you haven't played it and you haven't listened to the review yet to hear me, my thoughts on it, I highly, 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 highly recommend you play Final Fantasy VII Remake. It is fucking awesome. Uh, But first, play the original Final Fantasy if you haven't. If you have not played the original, you will get so much more out of this one if you play through that first. And I'm telling you, it's not a waste of your time to play the original. It's actually pretty good too. But definitely play Remake. I bought a PS4 specifically to play Last of Us 2 and Final Fantasy VII. Uh, I'll talk more about Last of Us 2 in a minute. But Final Fantasy VII Remake alone made it worth my time uh to buy a playstation 4 again it was totally worth it. the game is so game of the year fuck it's so good like, well we'll see if it ends up being game of the year but it sure is right now um i've been trying to play a few less games so last week or so i posted it's funny i posted a pic on our instagram uh which if you follow us we'll follow you back at member the game um i posted a pic of myself sitting outside with my dog reading a book in the sun because it has been gorgeous here in edmonton the last few days and our winters i mean i know some of you guys have bad winters too but like we have pretty shitty winters and so we really appreciate like 10 degrees celsius outside is fucking summer uh i mean it does actually get to like 20 and 30 but like 10 degrees feels like summer and it's been gorgeous here the last week so i've been spending some time out on my deck with my dog and i posted that i was trying to play a little bit less video games i said i'm finally gamed out from the lockdown and some of you guys were like what no it is it was like trust me i'm still playing video games i play every day I play it a few different sessions every day, but I am like, I'm finally, I don't know if anyone else is like this. Like I'm finally hitting a point where I'm like, okay, I, I need like, I got to do something else. So like every day I'm, I'm, I'm doing a little something around the house. I might paint some walls. I've been doing some projects. Like I'm reading more. I'm redesigning my stand-up comedy website, abcomedy.net. You can check that out if you're interested. Uh, the redesign isn't up yet, but I'm working on that. You know, just trying to stay busy, play a couple hours in the morning. And then I play for a few hours every night when my girlfriend goes to bed. Um, like, I mean, cause it's killer backlog time, right? Like killer. I'm trying to knock a few more games off my backlog in the next month. Uh, Metal Gear Solid five, final fantasy 15 in particular is one that I really haven't played yet that I really want to play. Plus they're both on game pass on my Xbox and I want to get through them before they leave game pass. Cause I don't have to pay for them. Um, 
So I don't know. I just shout out to all of you that reached out to me on Twitter, which you can follow me. I'll follow you back again. Also at member the game. Uh, when I posted about working on my backlog and how it's such a killer time, I want to know what you guys are working on. And uh, a bunch of you reached out, told me what you were playing. And I, I love that kind of stuff. Like it's, I love talking gaming. Like I hate social media, but I love talking games. And so like, I know I've been much less active on social media lately. It's just, there's so much negativity out there, but I love popping onto the member of the game one once or twice a day and just chatting video games with you guys. It's so good. Um, also quickly, before I get into talking social media and video games and the news that is going on right now, um, my buddy, Chris, very good friend of mine, a uh, supporter of the show, frequent guest on the show, got me a Game Boy Advance for my birthday, uh, last year or the year before. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, and with it, he got me a copy of Mother 3, uh, which was the English translated version, which you don't know is the sequel to Earthbound that never came to North America, which is fucking rad, and you should play it if you get a chance. But that's the only game I have for my Game Boy Advance. And I missed most of the good Game Boy Advance games. I just I was kind of in and out of gaming at that time. That was when I was really in my bar hopping stage of life. So I'm looking for game suggestions for the Game Boy Advance. Please keep in mind, I'm going to have to order them off the internet, and I don't have a ton of money, so I don't want really expensive ones. But if there's like a moderately priced Game Boy Advance game out there that you think is a hidden gem that I should be playing, please shoot me a suggestion, and I will look into it. Uh... Yeah, I'm interested in anything. I'm just looking for ideas. So just shoot those my way, please, if you would. Let's talk games. Let's talk social media. Let's talk news because all three of those things come together into this next story. In case you by some chance don't know, Last of Us 2 has a new release date just weeks after they canceled the original release. So it was delayed before and then it was supposed to come out at the end of May and then they came out and and delayed it a few weeks ago. And they said it was delayed indefinitely. And there was a ton of stories floating around about, are they worried about the sensitive to uh, subject matter? If you don't know, I guess without spoiling anything, The Last of Us is uh, set in a universe where like a virus has kind of transformed most of humanity into zombies. And it's kind of our anarchy and stuff like that. It's a very dark game. Some people thought it was delayed because of that going on in relation to what's going on in the world today. Some people thought it was delayed because which is what I think most people have agreed is the reason. Uh, they were worried about their physical sales because obviously a lot of gaming stores and stuff are closed and it's harder to produce that stuff. So while the digital sales will be there, physical games might take a hit or the physical game sales might take a hit. Uh, and then if somebody sees spoilers and stuff from a digital person that played, then maybe they don't even go out and buy the physical version. And So, I mean, maybe they were worried about that. There's a few different rumors as to why it got delayed. But it turns out that now it's not being delayed very much further. It's going to be coming out June 19th. And the reason for that is because one of their disgruntled employees or ex-employees, I'm not sure, has leaked the game. Has leaked the major plot stories and some of the scenes and a whole bunch, basically everything. Um... Uh, and now they basically Naughty Dog and Sony and everybody there are like, well, we have no choice now. We have to get this game out before everyone just gets fed up with waiting and reads the spoilers and then nobody buys our game. And uh, I'm going to warn you all right now. I'm not going to I'm certainly not going to reveal any spoilers on here. I don't want to see any spoilers. I have seen a couple of spoilers. Potentially, I was scrolling through Reddit and I'm subscribed to the PlayStation 4 uh, forums on there. And I was scrolling through my Reddit the other day and someone posted spoilers in the topic of a Reddit post. If you're not familiar with Reddit, it's like a giant message board, but you have to click a topic before you can read all the discussion about it. So most of the times when people are going to post spoilers, the topic would say Last of Us 2 spoilers and then they would tag it spoilers and you have to click it to go in and read the spoilers. But this knob just posted the spoilers in the subject and it's been deleted and it's gone, but I've unsubscribed from the PS4 forums for now because it sounds like that kind of shit is happening all over the place. And I just have to say, for the record, if you're out there and you're posting spoilers like that, if you want to read the spoilers and then post them in a private discussion where nobody will accidentally click on it, then I guess that's your prerogative. That's fine. But if you're just going out and posting them in general public and not trying to hide it and basically just trying to spoil the game for fucking people like me and a whole bunch of other people out there that have been waiting and waiting and waiting for The Last of Us 2, on behalf of all of us, go fist yourself. Like, it's just the most ignorant, like, what the fuck? As it is, we're all kind of depressed. We're all kind of down with what's going on in the world right now. This is like a huge ray of sunshine where a whole bunch of us are happy to get to play, like, one of the most anticipated video games in years, one of the most anticipated sequels in years, and you fucking knobs have to go out there and try to ruin it for everybody. And I don't know if what I read is true or if they just made them up to fuck with all of us. I guess I won't know until I play the game, but I've unsubscribed from the PS4 forums and I'm going to be on social media even fucking less than I was before just to try to avoid 
spoilers for that game because uh, I'm really excited to play it. Like I'm really and it like my most anticipated games for the years. I've been saying for months were Final Fantasy VII remake, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, and Last of Us Two. Ori and the Will of the Wisps was like a nine point five. Final Fantasy VII remake was like a nine point nine, and I have no doubt that Last of Us Two is going to be awesome because I just want more of the original game. That's all I got to do, and I'll give your game practically a perfect ten because I'm so excited for it. Um, it got delayed, 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 and now it's here, June nineteenth, and that sucks so hard for Naughty Dog, but it's sweet for all of us because at least we get to play it. And I've seen people calling Naughty Dog greedy for delaying the release in the first place because they wouldn't make as much money if they had released it at the end of May with the physical sales being down and stuff. It's not greedy. It's not like I mean, it's I mean the way they treat their employees. Sure, apparently that's greedy. I'm not going to go into great detail here. It's not hard to find. Just be careful what you Google because there's fucking spoilers everywhere. But you can read all about the alleged ways that they cheat their employees at Naughty Dog, who's the developer, uh, who's the developer of Last of Us and all that kind of stuff. Sure, maybe the way they treat their employees and stuff is shitty, but it's not greedy for a company to spend tens. I don't even know how much money. I have to assume eight figures at least on development of one of the most anticipated sequels uh, of video games ever and then want to make sure that when they release it, they can maximize the return they see on the investment they've put into this game for years. That's not greedy. That's fucking business. If you built a bench and you put 40 hours into building your bench and they decided you wanted to sell it for $300 instead of $200 or something, like, you're not greedy. You're deciding that's what the time and investment you put into something is worth. And that's what they're doing with last of us. It's, and guess what? Like if they don't make money, we don't get games. So it's not greedy. It's fucking business. Ah, fuck. I hate social media. There's people, Oh, they're so greedy. Why didn't they just release it earlier? Who cares if you could, they're going to lose out on some physical sales. Those physical sales are probably going to be tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. You fucking idiots. And it's not only that, there are places in the world where on like their internet's not good enough to download Last of Us 2. The only way they're going to get their hands on it is with a physical copy. And if the internet copy comes out months before the physical copies do, then they're going to have an even harder time avoiding spoilers than they're already having because there's also fucking knobs online leaking the spoilers everywhere for people like me who've just been waiting for years to play this fucking game. I fucking hate social media so much. I'm excited. I'm excited for this game. Sucks for Naughty Dog, but it's good for us. June 19th. I cannot fucking wait. Like, I repurchased my PlayStation 4 just to play Final Fantasy 7 and Last of Us 2. And Final Fantasy 7 alone made it worth repurchasing, but Last of Us 2 is going to be the icing on the cake. I cannot wait. Um, and honestly, I mean, unless a surprise release, like these Mario games that have been rumored for the Switch or something come out, like, once I'm done with Last of Us 2, uh, there's not a new release coming out that I'm really jacked for until Cyberpunk in the fall. Uh, which is perfect because I want to catch up. Like I said earlier, every gamer out there right now should be working on their backlog. It's the perfect chance to work on it. You can't go out anyways. Um, you know, I, plus I want to dive into more retro games for the show, uh, which I'm really enjoying doing, which is going to be how I, I get into that. Speaking of that, uh, what have I been playing? That segue looks so much better on my note sheet than it did coming out of my mouth. Um, what have I been playing over the last seven days? Primarily KOTOR. Uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, which won our Patreon poll for April. So we'll be doing an episode about it next month sometime. Um, I'll be honest with you guys. It started out so slow at weird mechanics. I didn't quite understand it. I was mad at all you guys for making me play this fucking game that I don't want to play. Uh, but I grinded through that and it's really, the ball is rolling now. I'm really getting into it. I'm pretty excited. You're going to get an episode all about it next month, but it's not going to be nearly as negative as it would have been about 10 hours of gameplay ago. Uh, I've also, I finished Mario Odyssey for the second time, a hundred percent, 880 moons. Uh, that game's borderline perfection. I love it. I'll play it again eventually. I'm sure I will. Uh, I've been playing through Halo 3 whenever I need a break from KOTOR because they're both on my Xbox. Just now that we finally have the Halo 2 episode re recorded, I have to jump back into the Halo campaigns. My goal is to play through all of them again slash eventually because I haven't even played all of them before. And then I'm still playing a ton of Slay the Spire on my Switch, uh, which, again, try it. If you got Game Pass, it's free. Fucking try it, try it, try it. It's so good, I promise you. Slay the Spire. And then Picross, the little puzzle game. That's become my new get stoned and watch TV and play game. So uh, lots of games I'm still playing. Don't worry. It's not like I've given up video games. I'm just trying to cut back a little bit. That's what I have been playing. Let's talk Spyro the Dragon, you guys, here at episode 94 of the show. One of the issues with this podcast that I've had pretty well since I started it is that I just haven't played everything that people want 
to see covered on the show. I just haven't. And and I don't have to finish a game or love a game to cover it on the show, but I have to have played it enough to hold a conversation. And there's a ton of games out there I haven't. And so I'm slowly working through that list. That's why we came up with the Patreon poll where every month they get to vote on one of the games that I haven't played before that I will play and then cover here on the show. And Spyro won our first ever one. Pardon me, last month. Uh, and I'm excited to cover it. Spyro is one of those games I've been wanting to play forever. I played it on my PlayStation Classic via hacked ROM. Just to give you guys an idea, I do not have a dual analog controller. It's got that cheap piece of shit that came with the PlayStation Classic. But I'm really excited to talk about this game. I've talked about it with my pal Darren Morris. He returns to the show. He's a fellow comedian who's been after me to cover this game since like episode 50 of the podcast. So it is finally time. I am going to cue some charming music. I actually don't know if this will be the charming music or actually some of the cool music. But anyway, we are going to talk Spiral the Dragon, which originally released in North America on the PlayStation 1 on September 10th, 1998. Kick back and relax, wash your controllers, and enjoy the podcast this week, you guys. Here we go. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Everyone that listens to this podcast knows about our illustrious CEO, my dog Molly. But the other silent partner behind the scenes is my wife. And let me tell you, my friends, a 17-year relationship with another person that has to talk to and live with you is a lot harder to maintain than one with a dog. We've had our ups and downs, and as you all know, a relationship isn't all sunshine and rainbows. They can be a lot of work. You get out what you put in when it comes to relationships, and talking to a therapist can be a fantastic way to put in some work. They can help you work through your issues, learn to communicate better, and even just provide you with an ear to bend when you need it. I've talked to my therapist about my relationships, especially when it came to my stand-up comedy career and how much I was away from home, and they helped me work on ways to keep my relationships strong even when I was out on the road. Uh, it turned out our relationship was actually better when I was out on the road, but that's that's a story for another day. And I know, right? Therapy. Who has the time these days? BetterHelp hears you, and they're making it easy. Fill out a quick form online, and they'll match you up with a therapist that suits your needs, and that'll work around your schedule. You pick the meet times, and you can get your therapy fix from anywhere, over video, phone, or just chat. Become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit BetterHelp.com slash RememberTheGame today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash RememberTheGame. Okay, so joining me this week via the wonders of telephones and internet and electricity is a fellow comedian, a buddy of mine from Calgary, former guest on the show. Uh, I don't know if you want me to say your last name, Darren, because I don't know if you want to keep your identity. Oh, yeah, you can, you can, yeah you, you can keep saying that. Okay, Darren Morris. Well, how's it going, buddy? I, I should have asked you that before I hit record, and I was like, oh, well, I don't, this, people well, know what to right. expect from this. Uh, how's, how are you doing? How's lockdown life? Uh, no, it's going pretty well, playing a lot of games these days, but uh, didn't usually have time to do that, but now I do, so oh, keeping busy with that. So many games, and uh, yeah. and the game we're talking about today, you have, because dude, I can't remember, you were on the show, we talked about Bart's Nightmare, like, I don't know. Last year. A like year ago. Time last year, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And uh, I remember at that point, you brought up Spyro the Dragon. And I had never played it, and I just kept dragging my feet and dragging my feet, and then it finally won our Patreon poll, so I was like, all right, you know what, I'm going to play through Spiral the Dragon. And, uh, dude, I get it. I get why you hyped it up. I understand now. I, it's really oh, it's good. Awesome. It's really good. Yeah. Like, you said this is one of your favorite games ever. Top three, definitely, yeah. Top two, probably, between this and Ratchet and Clank, but top two, yeah. The original Ratchet and Clank? Any of them, really. Yeah, yeah I like the Ratchet <laughs> yeah. and Clank games, too. Um, yeah, it was really good, dude. I saw some people before I played it comparing it. They were saying it was like the PlayStation's Banjo Kazooie, and I don't know if I would. Uh, I don't know if I would quite go that far, but um, because it's not so much like Banjo Kazooie is so reliant on that buddy can mechanic, you know what I mean? Whereas this one, it's basically Spyro. Like you've got sparks that little wiener flying you, but he doesn't do anything. 
Um, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I'd agree with the banjo kazooie thing. I, I think it's I think of it its own its own thing. But the thing that's crazy is this came out around the same time. It might even yeah, it came out. It might even come out before banjo kazooie because I think this came out in '98. Yes, it did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I I like to think a spiral is its own thing, but uh, yeah, I can see the similarities, I guess. But yeah, it's. Uh, Oh man, it's awesome! I can't wait. See, I always like I always associated this game with Crash, just because they were like the two like Nintendo's got Mario and Donkey Kong. Do you know what I mean? And like, and I always just kind of put the two of them together. And maybe that's because their remakes are always sold in packs now, like online on sales and stuff like well, that. Well, I think also their commercials were always very similar too. I think like I don't think they had the same developers, maybe. But I mean, like if you think about like those old Crash Bandicoot commercials and the old Spiral commercials, they're all kind of like like legitimately funny and kind of a little bit like uh i don't know how to word it like kind of putting it into the real world if, if the, yeah i i see the similarity i've always kind of ba- uh, put those two together as well with spiral and crash but uh oh i, I the th- spiral is awesome yeah I can't, I, I, like like the thing is is like i think crash crash is harder no question Although i should say i've only played the first spyro but I've played well, all three the, crashes, both the original and the remake, and I found Crash more challenging than Spyro. But well, Crash towards the end has some of those really complicated levels. But uh, I think Spyro is tricky if you're trying to get a hundred, like the absolutely everything. It is, especially in some of those later worlds. Like uh, I forgot which one it's in, but it's like when you're having to go down that like kind of mountain. Um, it almost looks like a bridge sort of thing and there's like the green power up thing that you have to like time it and jump it and get like Spyro is hard if you try to get absolutely everything whereas I feel Crash Bandicoot you don't have to get every single Wampa Fruit you don't have to get every single uh, see, like I, I would say they're, they're comparable I guess yeah I think the like, Crash like I think Crash is a little bit difficult just to beat the game and if you try to 100% it it gets like pull out your hair difficult Whereas yeah. if you just want to beat Spyro, like this is one of the few games, because I did, I 120%ed it. Uh, like I did everything, uh, which I rarely do. And you and I were talking about this off air and I was like, I want to save it for the show. I very rarely like 100% or platinum or whatever you want to call it, like do the completionist run of a game. And I had no intention of doing that with Spyro. I was like, I'm going to play it like 10 or 12, like 10 hours or something, like enough to get like a good feel for it for the show and that'll be it. And then I just found myself so entrenched it like i really was just in, i was having so much fun that i was like no i'm gonna i'm gonna do the i'm gonna go the distance with this one um, i feel they do a, i feel they do a really good job of kind of drawing you into wanting to do everything like when you lo- look into the little guidebook section and it says oh you finished 88 percent of stony hills or whatever or you finished like 90 like and you're like oh i need to get like you really kind of strive to that hundred percent when you kind of see your progress all the way through. Yeah, absolutely. And like, here's a tip for all the game developers that don't listen to this show. If you're going to make a collectathon style platformer, which is what this is, it's definitely got the collectathon like aspect to it. Uh, if you're going to make a game like that, make those counts and make the percentages and everything and make them very easy to see. Cause nothing to me is more frustrating than when I like, I'm like, I'm having a lot of fun with this. I think I'm going to try to hundred percent this. And then I have no idea how close to hundred percenting it. I am. Yeah. It drives me insane. Whereas this one, you're right. You hit, so I think it's like select, whatever you hit the button. And then not only can I see the counts for the specific level and the specific world that I'm in, but then it's got the percentage of the overall game completion and I can flip through all the world. Like, yes, that's how you make a collectathon game like this is like that. When you played through it, were you, uh, were you going for all the gems and all the dre- like, were you just trying to get the bare minimum to go to the next world or were you trying to get that stuff from the start? No, I wanted everything right away. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like away. when I was a kid, I, when I was a kid, when I was playing this back when I was like in junior high or something like that, um, or oh, maybe even before that, I was more focused on just trying to get through, get to the next world, get to the next world. And then all of a sudden I'm at like the third world and everything, all my, all my, uh, laziness caught up with me because then i needed this many gems this many dragons to move on i'm like oh i was just trying to get the bare minimum to squeak by so it's definitely good to do it like that from the start yeah i could see that being an issue back like because like this was still when like this concept of game was newish like i feel like and i mean i've shit all over it but i feel like mario 64 kind of introduced that concept of like you have to have so many stars before you can move on to the next 
you know, painting and stuff like that. But it was still a very new idea to us back then. So I could see how you'd rush through and then be like, oh shit, I need more. Whereas now, yeah, like yeah. after 20 plus years of playing these games, like, you know, goddamn well, you're going to hit a point where you need to have at least, you know, 70% of the collectibles to keep, you know, to end the game. Right. And I didn't, and yeah. I hate backtracking. So I was like, I'm just going to try to finish this thing in one run. Um, and it starts out like it starts because like I had the assumption that this was a game for babies. Like I just because oh, like, yeah, it does. Right. Does it not come across as that? Like it does. Well, it does. But then you kind of get a you get like the uh, concept of what like Spyro's whole attitude is and stuff. And then you start seeing kind of like the humor and the jokes and stuff when they rescue the dragons of like, oh, let me tell you a story. And so I was like, no, no, I'm good. And yeah. then, like takes off like it, it's uh, it def- like I feel it kind of is a game that can appeal to all ages and skill levels. Like if you're like a six year old, you're perfectly happy just kind of frolicking through the field, blowing up sheep and stuff. But then like someone like our age could still get quite a bit out of it and enjoy it beginning to end. So it kind of, I feel it's a great game to kind of, uh, appeal to all those different levels and ages. Yeah, it is. Like my girlfriend is a very casual gamer. And as I was playing through this, cause like you've mentioned, and you're not the only one. I've had a few people mention the the Reignited trilogy, the remakes. And yeah. I was, I, I, and my goal is now I want to play through Spyro two and three on my original PlayStation before I play the remakes. Um, okay, yeah. But I was telling my girlfriend as I was playing the first one, I was like, "This is one that I think that you you would like, like as a casual, not because she's a girl, but as a casual gamer." I was like, "You could hop into this and just have fun, like, and you don't mm-hmm. have to do everything." Because you know, you're right, dude. Like it, there's a few levels and there's a few hidden things and stuff like that that are just fucking vicious like it, like i die i had a couple of game overs playing this which i would have never expected in the first couple of worlds because the first couple yeah. worlds are like cruise control like i was having so much fun i was up here i had my window open and i had some music on because i had turned some of the music down on my tv and i just was like i'm like this is so chill and relaxing and it's satisfying when you 100 percent a level and everything and then all of a sudden it yeah. just seemed like the they t- cranked it up a notch and it got fucking vicious like, well, thing is, is like you can rack up those game overs pretty quick when you run when you jump off of like four cliffs in a span of th- of thirty seconds. It's like, me. oh, yeah. Like I and I like, listen. I, and I don't know, and I hate doing this with games that I didn't play back when they first came out because I don't have the uh, like the nostalgia for like when it was new and fresh. And so I never want to criticize a game for a mechanic that's been improved since it came out because back then that's just what it was. But like. And and I also played this on my PlayStation Classic where I don't have a dual analog controller because Sony's yeah. cheap as fuck, so I had to use the D-pad. Uh, yeah, there were a few instances, particularly those fucking turbo jumps where you like oh. sprint and jump, where I could not get the timing down of how to get them to do like the super jump up in the air. Um, well, it's fair. It's fair for you to bring that up, bring that up with the analog thing, but. Like when I first played through it, the analog did exist back then. Like this is one of the first games I think that was like the analog. I actually have that game in front of me right now. Like it is analog controller compatible. Uh, but the thing was, is when I was playing it, I didn't get my first analog controller. I think I might've got the same Christmas, my first analog controller and Spyro in the same Christmas. But back then you're not used to the analog controller at all. You're used to the arrow buttons. So like, Back then, the air, I found the arrow button so much easier because, like, the analog was just so, not clunky, but it was, like, too sensitive, I felt, and I had a hard time controlling it. So even though I had that brand new analog controller back in, like, 1998, I was still using the direction pads because I just I got frustrated with it. But it's just funny how, like, decades of gaming and now being accustomed to analog and you can't go back the other direction. No, it's weird now. Now, you like, any anything two-dimensional... Uh, I, I cannot play it with an analog stick. Like it's gotta be the D pad has to be, but like Ooh. anything three dimensional, I'm so used to an analog now. Cause I agree with you, especially that original PlayStation one dual shock, like those analog sticks are so loose. Like, I don't know how to, like, there's no, like there's no resistance in them at all. And they, I do find them to this day. I find that controller hard to use. Like even with those dual analogs. But I, I'm so mentally trained to do an analog stick now on a 3D game that, yeah, like, fuck me, man. I was dying. I, like, especially trying to hug, like, tight turns and stuff like that. Because that's yeah. another thing that by the end of the game, I loved it. But at the start, to control the camera, you use the shoulder buttons. 
Oh yeah, yeah. And that's I think that might be different in the Reignited trilogy. I think it kind of ha- I think in the Reignited trilogy it handles like a uh kind of like your random third person shooter kind of thing where you have to like I think it it's a, I think they adjust the controllers in the remake. Yeah, I'm sure they do. It's the same as like the Banjo-Kazooie re-release. There's no you don't have the C buttons. Like those four mm-hmm. seat, you have the second joystick. On the 64, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, and I, when I originally started playing this game, I was like, what the fuck? I'm never going to get used to this. And by the end of the game, I was so used to that, that like I'm playing Mario Odyssey on my Switch right now and I found myself trying to work the camera with the shoulder buttons. <laughs> like I really liked it. It just took a little time to get used to because I wasn't, I was so adjusted the other way. But once I got into it, I was like, that's a great decision by Insomniac, particularly for some of the levels where you need to like, to catch those egg thieves where you have to hug the edge of a fountain. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Or hug a cliff. And you can just hold the turbo button down, which forever I didn't realize that I don't have to hold up. Like once I hit the turbo button, he just runs forward. You just have to steer him. Um, once I figured that out, and I figured out that I could turn the camera as I'm turning him to almost like drift. Do you know what I mean? Like to hug yeah, those yeah, corners. Yeah. Man, that changed the game for me. Like that's a really and I, I this game is 22 years old, and to me that is still a phenomenal game design. Like so phenomenal. When you think of like. If you were to, it's like, I don't know, like you've played a lot more different PlayStation games than I have probably. Like for me, I've only really kind of played what you would refer to as like the childish ones, like the Crash Bandicoots, the Spyro the Dragons and stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, if you were to pick like one game for the PlayStation 1 that you feel like encompasses and like displays the best version of that console, like if you were to argue to your grandkids about how good the, play, uh, the PlayStation 1 was, what game would you choose? For me, it's Spyro. I'd be like, this is the best. Like, I would use Spyro if I was trying to convert a kid to say how good the PlayStation 1 was as a console. Honestly, like, yeah. See, that's tough because I'm I'm like, I am not a PlayStation 1 fan as a, oh, okay. as a whole. But having said that, probably Tony Hawk 2. Um, mm. Probably. But having said, like, dude, Spyro worked its way into, like, easily onto my top 10 PlayStation game list. Probably my top five PS1 game list. Like, th- I definitely have some beefs, and we'll get more into those in a minute, because I have a couple of things that I'm going... I've been waiting... Because I finished this game about two weeks ago. We haven't had a chance to do this podcast, and I've been yeah. waiting to get this shit off my chest. So I have some criticisms. But I wonder no. if they're the same as my... I, I only have two criticisms, but I don't know if they'll be the same. I think one <laughs> will be. Um, But it did climb its way into my top five, I think, for sure. Because you're right. It Like... At a glance, I'm like, this is a game for babies. Because again, I associate it with Crash, and I always just, for fair, whether it's fair or not, I just kind of chalked this up to being like baby Crash. Do you know what I mean? Crash was for the older kids that wanted something harder. Spyro was for the little brother that just had to have a game. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, Um, yeah. And and I, I now I'm not sure if I can if I prefer Crash or not because Crash is more. Like run like a jumping platform platformer, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas this is a collectathon, which I don't normally like, but there's something about the the collecting aspect of this game. I think you know what I like about the collecting aspect in this game is that it it never feels overwhelming. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like it's very very well done. If you get into a level, whether there's a hundred gems or two hundred gems or five hundred gems, there's there's pretty well a way to go from beginning to end. And if you're thorough and go the right way, you you'll get, get everything. All. Yeah, and I really, really appreciate that. It's almost kind of like, well, back then, like the open world games, it's not like it is now. Like it it gave you like an open world feel while you were still very directed in where you go, this place next, this place next, this place next. And like you said, you can get all that stuff quite easily. Yeah, I love that. Because like I, dude, like I'll tell you, Donkey Kong 64 pretty well ruined collectible games for me for a while. Like I hate that fucking game. Uh, Mm -hmm. because there's so much backtracking and searching for the collectible shit and everything. I hate it. Whereas this game, like it was maybe the second or third level in, uh, where I realized that like, Oh, if you go the right way and you're just very thorough and meticulous, you should get everything in one run. And by the end of the game, that's not the case. Like some of those levels, you could get them in one run, but you'd have to know where it all is. Like there is some exploring to happen, but, uh, uh, but they deserve a ton of credit for that. Like just to think ahead and be like, Hey, Cause nobody, it's not fun to go back through a level that admittedly like oh, it's isn't, tedious, pre- yeah. it's so tedious. And admittedly, a majority of the levels aren't that challenging in this game when you're just walking through the base level. 
You know what mm-hmm. I mean? When you're just trying to get from the beginning to the middle to the end or whatever. Um, and that can be incredibly tedious. And so at least they found a way to be like, hey, pay attention and you won't have to come back here. And I thought that was a great touch. Like, great. So, would you say that this game, like, you know, when you say sometimes like games don't age well, like you remember it being so awesome, like like the original Star Fox for the SNES. Like, oh my God, this is so good. Then it go back and like, this is garbage. Yeah, the game's like, aged terribly. <laughs> would you feel like would you feel this game aged well? I feel like the animation and like the uh, just what the general look of the game, even though it's a bit more pixely on the original PlayStation One, I feel it still looks good. Yeah, I do think it. I think it looks good. I mean, um, you know, again, I've been quite critical of the that first era of 3D, the P- the PS One, Nintendo sixty four era's graphics. And like fairly or unfairly, because they're just they're the Atari games of 3D. Like that's just you know that's when they were learning how to make <laughs> these games, right? Yeah. So, but no, having said that, I do think this game looks good. I think that the most of the levels look good, considering that like when you really stop and look at a level in Spiral, there's a lot of empty space in each world. Like you know, walking from a group of enemies to another group of enemies. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it, it never felt super plain or boring to me. I think Spyro looks good. Uh, I think most of the most of the bad guys fucking cracked me up, dude. They're the best bad guy in the level or in any of the levels uh, by far, in my opinion. Are the like military guys in the desert world, like in the overworld? Oh yeah. And they run away and hide in the tents. And then when you burn the tents down, they moon you. Still there, yeah. Yeah, that was like that's like that's clever, like that, and and that I can tell what they are in that original like polygonal graphic style is really like that's that's a big thing like i think this game looks really good for a ps1 era game another thing in that level that you just brought up that i remembered that i don't remember ever seeing in a game at that time in 1998 is you had the cannons that were there that spyro himself could torch up and fire a cannon like that was so that was crazy to me to being able to like oh my god i like have this other weapon that i can use right here and like i've seen it in other games recently that are uh, the similar concept where there's like a huge turret that you can climb into and use in that spot. And those cannons in that level kind of offered the same thing. Yeah. Agreed. And it was That's like, cool. Yeah. And it was a little tricky because I was like, like I wasn't sure at first if I could use them. Do you know what I mean? Like, cause it doesn't really, like it doesn't really do anything to show you. You can use it until you just start using it. But you do realize mm-hmm. like there's a, I, I do feel like there's a, there's a hint, a very slight hint of problem solving in this game like a very slight hit and it's stuff like that where you're like, I obviously have to be able to shoot something here. Do you know what I mean? And it's yeah, just a matter of yeah. like, what else is there to be able to shoot? Nothing. It's gotta be this cannon. Right. Or it's like in dude, yeah. in one of the later levels, uh, you can like shoot a thing where it like shrinks bad guys or makes them bigger. Yeah. Yeah. And, I remember that one. And same thing. And I thought that was a really cool mechanic as well. And like, and you know what I like about it again, this is a tip of the hat to insomniac, the developer is that they, they knew it'd be hard to be completely accurate with it. So they just made it in the general area. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like it's dude, it fucking drives me insane in video games when there's something that can't kill you, can't hurt you. It can't, there's no, like when you're trying to make like a shot at something and all you have to do is keep trying just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more to, to line it up. But there's no, penalty for missing other than just try again try again. do you know what i mean yeah yeah it's not like you you, you have like unlimited ammo of that can yeah it just gets yeah. tedious whereas insomniac clearly was like okay like as long as they're close like no one's gonna have fun trying to line up this fucking shot so let's just yeah. you know what i mean just make it close and that's fine um no i like that i do i, I like for the most part i like the exploration when i was playing through the early levels i thought like this is easy, but relaxing. I found it like it was, a, it was a relaxing game. And then right around the third, I would say about the third world, things start to get a little harder. And admittedly, I had to look up where a few gems were because I just was completely lost. Completely well, the, lost. The thing with the gems is when you realize that like the enemies have gems in them, it gives you that incentive to actually kill every single enemy you come across. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Because you're almost going to be like, oh, did I kill this guy already once before? And then it's like, and then if the little uh, if the little silver ball comes out, you're like, okay, I've already killed this guy. But if a gem's like, oh, there's a gem I was missing. So yeah. like, it really makes that hundred percent completion a hundred percent. Like you killed every single enemy at some point in time. Yeah, and I like that not every enemy can be because you can either dash into them or you can blow fire on them. But I like that they not every enemy can be killed by both attacks. But it's for the most part pretty obvious which ones like a big a big enemy you can't dash into. 
and the shiny metal ones have the armor that the fire can't hurt. Yeah. And yeah, I totally. and just enough to keep you on your toes so you don't just get reliant on doing one or the other. Um, well, I think there was one that you had to uh, torch the back. Like, he was huge. He had armor on the front. And I think you had to swing and you had to torch him from the back or something like that. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. No, yeah, yeah, he was one of the bosses or whatever you want to call him. Like, one of the big guys, yeah. yeah. Some of the boss fights I found not even, like, difficult maybe is the word. I just found them, like, I was I didn't feel like they were necessary. Do you know what I mean? I was like, I'm having yeah. a good time with this game. Like, not every platformer ever made needs to have boss fights. Do you know what I like? And you, and that guy is one of the examples where like you have to do that little roll to dodge his attack and then get behind him and shoot him. But like the controls just aren't tight enough. You know what I mean? Like I, I found it very mm-hmm. difficult to get behind him and hit him and he wasn't even hitting me. Like I wasn't dying. It was just, if anything, I was dying from rolling off the edge of the island we were on, <laughs> which I did a few times. I probably died more times doing stuff like that than I did from bad guys or like trying to walk up to a cliff to look around. And then accidentally turning the camera and falling over the edge of the cliff. And so you think you see where you're supposed to go. You take off and it's like, oh, that's nowhere close to where I was going. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Cause there is like some pop in and there's just kind of the, like the flat wall distance. You know what I mean? Like, which again is just a product of the times, but there were more than one occasion where I thought I saw where I had to go. And then mid, mid glide realize like oh no that's the complete dead end but then you turn abort, around and abort. now you're yeah and now you're, you can't get high enough to get back to where you were supposed to be i died so many times like that and dude Especially once in the later levels i think right yes because once you yeah. start to realize that to get some of these gems and some of this treasure you kind of have to take some leaps of faith like you've got mm-hmm. to jump and kind of glide around the edge of a mountain or whatever do you know what i mean um, mm-hmm. yeah. and the only way to figure out which leaps of faith get you to more treasure and which leaps of faith will kill you are to take the leaps of faith. And I don't think that's yeah. necessarily a criticism. It's just, that's just, I don't know how else you get around that. Like, I think that's just something they had to do, but there were a few instances where I was just like, mother fuck, like there's, I'm missing 10, 10 gems and I've killed every bad <laughs> guy. They have to be around some ledge and I'm just jumping off stuff, trying to find them, you know? But yeah. at least they do a good thing, like you mentioned, where if you go through and re-kill bad guys, they drop those little silver balls, or occasionally they'll just drop an extra life. And every time you collect like 20 or something silver balls, you get another life. So they yeah. do a good job of kind of filling you back up. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I, I agree. Um, so yeah. that's one of the things that, that was one of your issues with the game then, right? Yeah, I would say, well, yeah, okay. That, I would consider that a minor issue. I have two big issues. I would, a minor issue, because I don't so much consider it a, I don't know what else you could have done. You know what I mean? Like, I think I prefer having to take leaps of faith to find hidden jewels to all the jewels being incredibly obvious as to where they are. You know, I think I yeah. prefer the trial and error. It just occasionally gets frustrating when you can't figure out what trial you haven't taken yet. Or so, sometimes you know, when you'll have to... Uh... It's basically, well, what'll be annoying is when it takes you like four or five minutes to get to that point that you were last. Cause there's not like, I don't recall yeah. there's any checkpoints or anything. You, you go to and, the last, you go to the last dragon pedestal. You like, unlock yeah, yeah. Game. So, or like, let's say like some of those later levels, it's difficult to uh, navigate your way through at times. Cause everything looks so, like, I'm, I, I don't remember what it was called. It's one of like those mountains with like the little staircase that circles around it. It's like the, that crazy jump. Like, everything looks so similar or it's hard to necessarily even find your way back to the spot you were at at yeah. times I found. Yeah. yeah. And okay. So that's, and all right. So now that's a great segue. Cause that's one of my two major criticisms. I, I fucking, I don't, I don't hate the dashing down the turbo ramp jump mechanic necessarily, but I hate how difficult it was to do. And there's one level in particular, which is the treetops, which I think is the one you're talking that's about. The one I'm, yeah, that's the one I'm talking I about. I hate yeah, that yeah. level. Like, I almost quit my playthrough on that level because I was getting I so kill, fucking I, angry. Yeah, that was the one level I think I killed myself more than any other level was the treetops oh. one. Just because you could fall off so easily. You could fall off easily. You had to basically nail, like, three of those turbo jumps in a row. And it, like you said... And time it perfectly and if you screwed up once then you're trying to figure out like what tree was i even on because there's not really like a map like an overworld you know what i mean like you can't just hit like pause and like bring up a blueprint of the level so then you're well, looking you're around moving Fuck. you're moving so fast and you're like you know where you were to start and you're like wait where what part did i did i was that the spot i had to do the big jump is that where i like and you're just kind of all over the place yeah that oh god that level and then dude there's one there's a dragon 
and probably 30 or 40 treasure in that level where the only way to get them is to nail like five fucking running turbo jumps and then you have to like fly over to the right like as soon as you take off from a turbo jump hug the right and land on this other one and then charge up it and the only way i found it was looking it up on youtube and then i yeah, still I couldn't that, do yeah. it like i couldn't do yeah. it forever that makes me feel bad well because that one i to be honest i don't think i played the game beginning to end when i was like 12 um but when i did play it again on the reignited trilogy i definitely went on youtube again for that exact part and i think i probably spent an hour to an hour and a half trying to nail it yeah i spent more time yeah. on that level than any level in the game by a mile and i was getting so yeah. fucking angry like oh and then i would get game over and then have to like go back to the level and then get all the way back to the start of the jumps again and figure you know fuck me so that's well, almost like well one thing you could do in cra so when we were talking about crash bandicoot earlier is like in Crash Bandicoot, you could just accumulate a ton of lives and not have to worry about losing your spot. Yeah. In Spyro, it's so hard to accumulate a ton of lives quickly. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that more and more, like pretty well every platformer out there coming out today has done away with the live system. Or if they have lives, they've made them so abundant that it doesn't really matter. You know what or I mean? Like checkpoints even. Like yeah. even if you, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's, because like you and I are about the same age. We both grew up with these old challenging games with game overs and checkpoints. It's like, I, I don't know. Maybe I've gotten soft in, you know, in my old age. But now I'm I'm a fan of my checkpoints every five minutes and my no game yeah. overs. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't need to start this all over again. Like, I, I used to be the old guy yelling at the cloud saying, like, oh, you kids, you, you got it so easy with your games. Like, oh, I'm almost dead. I'll hide around a corner for 12 seconds. Come back. Good. All right. Yeah. But I, I've I've gotten I've gotten uh, spoiled with that kind of stuff. Me too. Like I don't I have no interest in that anymore. So that I fall oh, fuck that <laughs> when I finally beat that level I was so happy because I didn't want to quit and I knew I was gonna go for the perfect run but I was so close to just being like I'm done <laughs> fuck this game like and then then I would have given it a shittier score and just been like no like that one level and almost every <laughs> every game almost every platformer has that one level that's just shit. And this one is it. It's got, it's the one. So the only other bad level for my money in this game are, and I don't even think all of them, but the last couple flying levels, the last oh, couple. Okay. Oh, I wonder if, okay. I think that's one of the things I was, I think I was going to call them time trial levels or whatever, oh. but yeah, those, I hated those. The only thing like gameplay wise, I didn't like about this game was like those time trial flying ones where you had to, go and get all the different things in one flight and whatever. And yeah. Like, especially because the thing is you don't actually need to go to those levels. I don't think unless you're going for that hundred percent, I think, I think a lot of them are optional. Are they not? Yeah, I think so. Well, they're the same, just like any other world where you just go into like the gate, but I'm sure you could get enough stuff. Through, yeah, like there's without no dragons. Them. In there's no levels, dragons. Yeah, yeah. It's just treasure. Uh, so, oh, and the thing about it, Darren is like, I thought the first couple were fine. Like, I was like, the controls are a little funky, but you get used to them. It frustrates me that he can fly in these levels, but then not fly in the regular game. But, it, yeah. it's, but that's like, just... Where, where, where is this gift of flight when I'm falling off of a cliff? Yeah. Come you yeah. know, and I, and I understand that like, that, like, that, like, like to be able to just fly would break the regular level. So I understand. But it just like... Yeah. So the first couple, I didn't mind because I was like, okay, I get it. You just have to figure out the pattern. And like, and I like that challenge of kind of like, it's the same as the treasure. If you figure out the right path, you can get everything in one like yeah. nice run. And I actually felt pretty accomplished. The first couple, I, I figured out the pattern, got the run done and was like, fuck yeah. Like I'm a boss. Like that was rad. Where it goes south is the first, the first time they introduced the fucking, the boats. Oh, um, oh fuck oh. me, Darren. Fuck me. Because you, you have to get them in the same uh like order or else all of a sudden you're on the other side of the map running out of time yeah and you have no idea where the last boat is or uh, whatever. Yeah. and they're hard to hit because you have to get pretty close to the water but you can't touch the water and then it's like and the water goes up and down and so sometimes it's hard to tell how close to the water you are like oh fuck me i was getting so mad at that fucking boat flying level and then there's an even harder one further ahead where the there's you have to get the the trains on the tracks, plus eight yes. random pl planes just in the sky, plus fly around the edge of this giant island well, to get you, eight gates and then get eight treasure chests too. Well, on that one with the planes, you have to go against the traffic. Yeah, you do. Otherwise, yeah. you're wasting too much time trying to catch up with them. Yeah. but And the same for the boats, really, as well, I think. Yeah. But I remember, like, I, I knew you were going to probably be asking about things you didn't like, but I know, like, 
for the last year or so, I've been ranting and raving about Spyro. So I was really trying hard to come up with <laughs> some things I didn't like about it. And that was one of them. And the other thing I'm going to say that I didn't like about it, that's going to sound really, really petty and small, but I feel like it wouldn't have been that much to fix this issue. And that was when you were saving the dragon, like I really got into the first part where it was like, oh, there's this funny sequence, a funny line, blah, blah, blah. But then they kind of got just a little lazy and it's like, thank you for releasing me. And it's like, oh, and then like they just started like repeating a bunch of thank you for releasing me one. And the other thing I wondered, like, what was so necessary about this is they started recycling dragons as well. It's like the guy you saved from world one. I'm like, wait, would have been that difficult to come up with like an extra five characters or five dialogue thing. I was, I, yeah, fuck. Fuck. I, I was like, I, I, I already saved it. Cletus. What the fuck? Like, and now it's Cletus again. Yeah, I, I don't even know. I, I don't know if it was because they're up against a deadline or, and that was just like, kind of like, oh, whatever, we'll just throw a couple of, ha- ha- thank you for releasing me. We'll, we'll repeat, repeat Cletus and we'll be good to go. Ugh. And it's like, but that, that, like, those are the only two things I had was those flying levels or the time trial ones or the time levels. And just the dialogue just kind of got a little bit lazy i felt with thank you for releasing me and then just gone yeah i agree with that because like you're right at the beginning especially some of those dialogues are funny and they're all so terribly voice acted but i love that that's my favorite thing about one of my favorite things about this era and particularly about the playstation is i love horrible voice acting and be it like resident evil or Mega Man 8 or now in spyro (laughs) where some of them like it's so like it it sounds like two actors like read the doing script all of them right yeah and they didn't do it like Matt Stone and Trey Parker just doing oh, everything <laughs> yeah you're right but there are a few of them that are really funny like stuff like the old guy wants to tell him the story yeah, and then Spyro does like, that no, I'm good. that really dry like uh no thanks like I, I I got a kick out of that and I also like cuz sometimes the dragons give you advice and it's like legitimate if you've never played the game before it's legitimate advice yeah. they're like hey the armored guys you can't hurt with your fire or something. And I was like, Oh, yeah, yeah. I get it. But, uh, but you're right. It feels like the last third of the dragons are like the same two messages on repeat. And yeah, I don't, and I feel I, it's been such a small thing. Like, like how, like I've never designed a game in my life. Uh, but I feel like that would have been such a small thing to change, you know, like just design another couple dragons, come up with like, get, get some out of work comedians to write something up. Yeah. And uh, I, I feel it would have been something small that would have made a big difference. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and then, oh yeah, and then one last thing I kind of, I, I didn't particularly, oh yeah, so we haven't actually said it, but like the boss's name, what is the boss's name? Like, what is it? Nasty Nork? Nasty Nork. Nork. Uh, Nork I, yeah. I didn't care for the boss fight, the final boss fight. Um, that was it, kind of a, yeah. Because it's just a ton of, it's a track meet. It's just a ton of running, which I'm like, I've done so much of this. Do you know what I mean? And then I'm like, well, I don't think I can hurt him. But then it's like, no, you can. You just have to do it exactly right. And if you miss him with your fire, now he's going to run around that entire track again. Yeah, because that, that would happen where you catch him. Like, you, it's almost like, it was almost like some of those like troll levels on Mario Maker. Yeah. Where you're like, okay, I'm here. I'm there. I, I'm where I need to be. But what do I do? Like, there's a couple times I was right there with him. And then I did, wasn't able to, yeah, or you don't know that there's a separate route the second time and you're like, what's going on? Where did he go? Yeah. And it's kind of hard to find him there. So I see what you're saying with that boss fight. But that's not just Spyro. Like I'm a, I'm a believer. Like I I, like shout out to video games that don't feel like they need a final boss. Like I'm one of those people that's like, I'm good, man. As long as you make the fun, like make the final sequence, like a fun platforming thing where I have to get away or something like that. And I'm good. Like I don't need a stupid boss. They did have, they did have that little like secret world. If you're going for the hundred, uh, the, the completion, hundred percent completion, there is that kind of small world where there's so much jet, so many gems, yeah. everything like that was kind of, that was kind of the end of it. Wasn't it? Yeah, it was. That was after you beat nasty Nork and then get every treasure and every dragon, but you needed every treasure to unlock yeah. that part. Then you and get that you final got the 120% or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And I actually really, you're right. Actually, I forgot about that. Cause I didn't like the final boss fight, but then I had to go play this final level where there's like, yeah, like 5,000 treasure or something. And you basically have to clean out like a level like a like the bottom floor of the level where you can only glide so high and then you can find a way to glide a little bit higher and a little bit higher and a little bit higher to yeah. get all the treasure and i actually really enjoyed that so yeah, yeah. Like get rid of the but nasty nor can make like that you and i who completed the entire thing even got to see that level if you just kind of went for the minimalist beating the game you don't even see that level yeah 
But no, I, yeah, fucking, uh, it was a great, dude, it was a great suggestion. I liked it so much, like, I'm not going to say so much more than I expected to, but I had a, I had a conception of what it was in my mind and it wasn't that at all. Like it was a lot yeah. more fun. I really enjoyed it. I don't tra- traditionally care for a lot of 3d platformers. And, uh, I had a lot of fun with this one. Like to the point where, again, I a hundred percent of it, which I never do or 120 percent of it. And I have every intention of playing through number two and number three, and I'll definitely get the remakes of them. As, as, assuming, right. assuming that shit doesn't go off the rails with number two or number three. I assume it's just more <laughs> of the same, right? Well, yeah, just let, let me know what you think of number two. <laughs> oh, okay. And as long as shit doesn't go off the rails and Darren's like, well, it, 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 well no, it was, they were good. And you know what? I just looked up because I wasn't sure who made it. And I'm trying to pay more attention to the developers of games because I know that the Crash games are Naughty Dog. Uh, yeah, I've got I've got the uh, case in front of me from the original one. It's, uh, yeah, Insomniac and Universal. Yeah, and you know Insomniac is the same company that makes Ratchet and Clank. And yeah, they're the and same I love company. Ratchet and Clank, yeah. Yeah, and they're the company that made Spider-Man for the PS4 a couple years ago. That's right, that's right. So uh, Wait, that, is, Cra- is Crash Bandicoot also Universal? Is that the tie-over? Is that um, how they're linked together? Is it universal for Crash? It might be. I just all that I might know be is what ties them together because I know they don't have the same developers, but I think they're both universal. They're very Maybe. attached to the hip, like they just yeah. are. I don't know if it's from being on the PS. Like to me, what attaches them at the hip is just again, it's that mindset of like anytime you see them on like the Nintendo eShop or Xbox or PlayStation or whatever, like the remakes, they're always packaged. You can buy it's a package of the, both of them. Crash has got to be universal. That's what. That's all I can think of. That would make sense. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like I, I got to play two and three before I decide which series I like more. Boy, if you told me right now that I could only ever play either Spiral the Dragon or Crash Bandicoot, like the original game for the rest of time, like I, I'd have to take some time. Like, I don't know which one I would pick. They're both really good. I think if I were to, I think Crash Bandicoot has more replay appeal. Like, I think if you're only going to play one, like beginning to end ever again, I think there's more enjoyment in Crash. Because with Spyro, it kind of gets the, you know where things are. You don't have to look for it again. Yeah. Whereas like Crash Bandicoot's more skill, timing, jumping. Um, you could play the game 10 times and every time you finish it, it'll be a different time elapsed on how long it took or whatever. Yeah, you're probably um, right. Spyro so could I think, become a speed run game. I think, I think Spyro is a good one and done. Um, I'll probably play it again one day. Uh, I don't know when I will be, but it's like I feel once you've accomplished Spyro, you don't have to necessarily go back to it. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You're right. You're probably right. Um, I really, like, dude, like, I thanks to everyone that voted in the Patreon poll, and thanks to you for, like, a year of every time I see you at a comedy show. Like, hey, have you played Spyro the Dragon? <laughs> you should play Spyro the Dragon. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to play Spyro the Dragon. And I, again, like, top 10 PlayStation 1 game for me for sure. I'd have to think about my top five because there's stuff like Final Fantasy and Tony Hawk and stuff, but it's a contender. Would you say it's your favorite of the genre for PlayStation 1? I'd have to... I don't know. It'd be it or Crash. It, I'd have to... Oh. It'd probably depend on my mood. If I'm oh, in the okay. mood for something a little bit more challenging, then I'm going to go Crash. But if I'm just looking for something to put on and like relax... like This is one of those few games that I feel like I could get baked and still play. And there's not a lot of games like that, but Spyro's one, right? Be like, just chill. It's nice. I even really enjoyed the early easy levels. I just really liked it. Oh, yeah. And quickly, because we're going to score and get out of here. Oh, yeah, for sure. Fucking massive props to Sparks the Dragonfly. I said at the very beginning that he doesn't really do anything, and I shouldn't have said that because when you don't have him and you physically have to collect every crystal or every gem that is laying (laughs) around, it sucks. Like, you fucking, he's a hero. Like, yeah, just just like being able to run with within relative vicinity of the treasure and he picks it all up for you is such a godsend when you don't when the first time you lose him and have to pick it all up yourself, you realize like, holy fuck, thank God for that stupid dragonfly. Yeah, yeah. Fuck. Um, OK, so it goes to 120 percent. So we'll score it on that on a, at a scale of one to 120. What would you score the original Spyro the Dragon for the PlayStation? Uh, 119.5. Just to keep... <laughs> Just the te- just the the repetitiveness of the dragon things. The only thing that really irked me throughout. Yeah, I'd say one hundred nineteen point five percent. Pretty right. generous. I'll go. <laughs> yo, that's yo. Hey, I, you know what? I'd go. Yeah, probably around a hundred and five at one hundred and twenty. It loses a couple points for that fucking treetops level, and uh, and it loses a couple of points for the fucking flying levels. The last couple flying levels. And if you're one of those people yeah. sitting there listening to this and you're like, well, just get good and then the flying levels aren't a problem. Get Go good. fuck yourself. I did get good. That's how I 120%ed it. <laughs> Go fish yourself. 
uh, Darren, good suggestion, buddy. Thanks for doing this. I'll yell at you after I finally get around to playing Spyro 2, and we'll see if we have good or bad things to say about it. All right. Sounds good, Adam. Have a good day. Thanks, buddy. That's going to do it for this week's episode. Darren, thank you so much for talking Spyro the Dragon with me. To all our Patreons that voted for Spyro the Dragon, thanks for suggesting that I play such a great game. And to every single one of you putting my ear or my voice into your ears right now, thank you so much for letting me be part of your brain. I really appreciate you guys listening to the show. Uh, do not sign up for the Patreon before May 1st. I can't remember if I said that, but if you're interested, please, if you sign up before May 1st, they're going to charge you in April, and they're going to charge you again in May. So don't sign up until May 1st. But please consider signing up. For only $2, you get a ton of stuff. It's all over there. Patreon.com slash Remember the Game. This Sunday, I will be giving you guys some predictions for next gen and breaking down the PS5, Xbox Series X upcoming war. And next week, we'll be back with episode 95 of the show. And I don't know what game it'll be yet, but I'll figure it out sometime in the next seven days. Kick it. Uh, kick it. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Sorry about the kick it thing. I'm not editing that out. I'm just going to sound like a loser. Uh, I was going to say kick back and relax, but that's how I say and You guys don't care. Thanks for listening, you guys. I'll talk to you again in seven days or less. Take it easy. Cheers. <laughs>